أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبا القاسم محمد عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روح وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفدا واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين منذ آدم إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعلها الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته يقول تعالى في محكم التنزيل بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط وأنزلنا الحديد فيه بأس شديد ومنافع للناس وليعلم الله من ينصره ورسله بالغيب إن الله قوي عزيز صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says in Surah Al-Hadid, verse 25, Certainly we sent our apostles with clear arguments and sent down with them the book and the balance that men may conduct themselves with equity and we have made iron, we have made the iron wherein is great violence and advantages to men and that Allah may know who helps him and his apostles in secret. Surely Allah is strong and mighty. Sadaq Allah al al just a brief recap last night, we discussed the affairs or the state of the world before the advent of Imam Al-Zaman very briefly. We discussed the struggle between good and evil, the struggle between the supporters of Allah Azza wa Jal and the supporters of Shaitan, the struggle between those trying to establish the kingdom or the state of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and those trying to prevent this. And we explained the types of corruption. We very briefly touched on the types of corruption that would fill the earth. And we explained that Imam Al-Hujjah, Sharif, the Imam would be the solution to mankind's problems. And tonight, inshallah, because what we said last night in conclusion was that only the government of Imam Al-Mahdi, alayhi salam, could provide the solutions to mankind's problems. Only the government of Al Muhammad والسلام, as Imam Al Baqir describes the government of Imam Mahdi, he refers to it as Dawlatuna, our government. The government of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, Imam Al Baqir referring to the government of Imam Al Mahdi, refers to it as our government, the government of Al Muhammad. We said that this is the only solution and that mankind will reach a point where it is mankind itself that gives up on all the solutions of this earth and looks to Allah Azza wa Jal and demands this form of government. Our discussion tonight inshallah is if, if we are claiming that the solution is the government of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam is Islam a religion of government or not? The concept of a religious state. Is it an Islamic concept? Is it a concept touched upon in the Holy Quran? Has the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi promoted this? Did our Imam sallallahu alayhi wa present Islam in such a manner? Do our fuqaha approach Islam in this manner or not? Before we answer this question, we're going to touch on the meaning of the term government. In Western philosophy, the term government is, means, it is the action or manner of controlling or regulating a state, an organization or people and the organization of the affairs of the people through legislation and law. 
There are many different definitions and they all swim around the same concept. That the meaning of a government is a body or an entity or a group of people or an establishment which has authority and is entrusted with organizing the affairs of the people. All of their affairs. We see here living here in, in Australia, for example. If you and I wanted to build a house, and this house needs a plot of land, and we have purchased a plot of land, and then we decided that on this land we're going to build a house. Even though in your mind this is a personal affair, I have purchased this land with my own money, and I will be building this house with my own money, there is no way that you can carry out this construction without authority from your local government, correct? This government will tax you. This government will also provide for you the essentials for living. It will provide gas and electricity and water so that this house is functional, correct? This government will also organize the collection of your rubbish. It organizes our health care, our education, our domestic policies, our financial policies, our foreign policy, our military policy. The government is entrusted in all of our affairs. And at some points, these particular governments transgress and get involved in the most personal of our affairs. Does Islam present such a government? Does Islam entrust a body, a person, an individual, or a group of individuals with running the affairs of the people? Before we touch on the verse that we just recited, in Shi'i thought, we as Imamiyya, Ithna Ashariyya, our ulama are split into three camps. There are three opinions regarding the issue of religious government, and all three are respectable opinions, and they are opinions of our ulama. The first opinion is that in the absence of the infallible, in the absence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in the absence of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, Islam has no role in governing the affairs of the people. There is no Islamic government. Governance is strictly in the time of the Masul. This is the first opinion. And those who hold this first opinion demand that people need to be governed at the end of the day. True? Otherwise we'd live in chaos. We'd be living in a jungle. Even the jungle has rules. Even in the animal kingdom there are rules. But we as human beings, we demand a form of governance in our lives. Our affairs need to be tended to. So even this group of scholars who are of the opinion that in the absence of the infallible there is no government and Islam has no role of government they say that we as Muslims we must hold on to a secular government and be law abiding citizens in a secular government whichever secular government is just the second opinion is that no In the time of the Ma'asum and outside of the time of the Ma'asum, Islam has a role. This second opinion says, yes, Islam has no government outside of the era of the Ma'asum. However, as Muslims, it is our obligation to hold on to a secular government which respects Islamic values. For example, we can use Iraq today. Iraq is a majority Muslim nation. And the majority of Muslims there adhere to the madhab of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. 
although there is a large minority of our Sunni brothers and sisters that live in Iraq. And there are Christians and there are Sabians and there are Azidis and there are so many different uh, sects of Ahlul Bayt, of Ahlul Kitab and outside of Ahlul Kitab. However, the majority, the overwhelming majority of Iraqis are Muslim and the overwhelming majority of these Muslims adhere to the madhab of Ahlul Bayt. They are Ithna Ashari Shia. Our maraja' in Najaf today say that yes, that the majority of them are of the opinion that because the ma'asum is not present, this does not mean we go to a completely secular government, nor does it mean we establish a purely Islamic government. So the opinion of these fuqaha is that we adhere to a secular government, a humanitarian government, which respects the values of Islam, for example. There are particular areas of Iraq where alcohol is illegal. Where bars and nightclubs are illegal. Where it is uncommon to see immodest dress codes. The meat which is given out in Iraq, which is sold in the streets and in the markets of Iraq and in the butchers of Iraq, need to be halal. The Quran has a role in the constitution of Iraq. The marja'iya has a role in the constitution of Iraq. And we have seen this in recent years. When Iraq was fighting its war against terror, it is the marja'iya of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam that stepped in and saved Iraq and the region from these terrorist organizations with their divine fatwa. We see the politicians flocking to the marja'iya for advice, flocking to the marja'iya for approval. So these ulama are of this opinion. That in the absence of the ma'asum alayhi salam, we have a state, a secular state, but in the, under one condition that this secular state respects the tenets of Islam. The third opinion, the third opinion is that, no. Islam is a religion of government during the era of the Ma'asum. And in every other era, whether the Ma'asum is present or not, Islam is a religion of governance. Islam has its own political system. Islam has its own social system. It has its own economical system. It has its own military system. Islam has its own policies, its own judiciary. Therefore, Islam as a whole must be implemented during the time of the Ma'asum and outside of the time of the Ma'asum. This is the third opinion. And the modern example that we have today is the Islamic Republic of Iran. May Allah Azza wa Jal preserve it. In conclusion, when we take these three opinions, these three opinions, although they differ, on one side they agree on one common principle. That at the time of the Ma'asum, Islam is a religion of government. All three of them agree with this. All three agree that at the time where there is an infallible present, Islam is the law of the land. Islam runs the state of affairs. The affairs of the people at every level. Socially, economically, religiously, jurisprudentially, from a judicial level. On every level, Islam has an answer. And this brings us to the verse that we open up with in Surah Al-Hadid. And we'll recap this verse. Allah Azza wa Jal, He starts off by saying, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ 
وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط Allah Azza wa Jal is putting out the mission statement of the prophets of the books that he has, the divine books he has revealed to the messengers over the centuries and centuries. He says, certainly we sent our apostles with clear arguments and sent down with them the book and the balance that men may conduct themselves with equity. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling you, I did not reveal these books for your entertainment. I did not reveal these books just so you can find serenity in them. No, I sent these messengers and these books and I sent with them Al-Mizan so that mankind can rule with equity. Justice needs to be the outcome. These prophets and these books came with law. And the aim of this law is divine justice. And the author of these laws is the divine himself. This is Allah Azza wa Jal speaking. Not me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the main reason I have revealed these books and the main reason I have sent these messengers is I am sending down a doctrine, a philosophy, a law, a government so that a government may be established and this government, its aim is to rule by the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and to establish equity and justice. And had there been any other method for establishing equity and justice, Allah Azza wa Jal in His wisdom would have informed us. He would not have sent 124,000 prophets to bring down their books and go through that hardship. And a great number of them were killed and murdered along with their families and children, including our holy messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. So the concept of government in the Holy Quran is established. More than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a strange turn takes in this verse. So on one, one point, he is speaking about the messengers and the books, and that they have been revealed to establish so that men can rule one another with equity. And then Allah azza wa jal says something very strange. He changes topics completely, or so it appears. He says, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلْيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ وَلْيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ وَرُسُلَهُ بِالْغَيْبِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ After saying that he has sent his messengers with these laws and these books so that equity may be established between people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we have brought down the iron. Iron. You know what iron is? It's a metal. What's iron got to do with anything? One minute Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about messengers and the, and the divine books and ruling by justice. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switches and begins talking about iron. And he says that this iron in it is great violence. And advantages to men. And that Allah may know who helps him and his apostles in the secret. Surely Allah is strong and mighty. Without going into a tafsiri discussion because of time's sake. According to some of our mufassireen, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions iron in this verse. And why he starts off by mentioning that iron... Through iron, there is great violence and there is also great benefit to human beings. Iron is a symbol of strength. It is a symbol of strength and enforcing. Because remember at the time the Quran is revealed, the great militaries of the world depended heavily on iron for their weaponry. 
Almost all of their weapons were made out of iron, their swords, their spearheads, their arrowheads. The more iron a nation possessed, the stronger its military was. It is a symbol of force, it is a symbol of might. So some of our Mufassireen have come and they've said that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions iron here and mentions the wrath of iron and the violence that iron can create because Allah Azza wa Jal wants to emphasize the importance of enforcing these books and enforcing this justice and equity. Allah Azza wa Jal is making a point here. He's telling you, yes, through iron there is a form of violence. However, also through this iron and through enforcing these laws of Allah Azza wa Jal and enforcing and establishing the government of justice and equity, there is great benefit to men. And this is something that sometimes we try to sidestep, but I'll touch on it, inshallah and continue because it's very important to understand this. And some people are uncomfortable talking about particular situations. But Islam has a very firm stance on violence, okay? We are not a passive religion, nor are we an aggressive religion. We are not a religion that will sit back and allow our enemy to take from us and trample on us and spread their corruption and follow this silly dogma of turn the other cheek nor are we the type of religion that is commanded to oppress and subjugate others and trample on their rights and steal their lands with ayadu billah no islam is the religion of allah azza wa jal the most wise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom because he is the creator of this creation and he understands man. Allah azza wa jal knows that in order for mankind to prevent or slow down the spread of aggression and corruption and tyranny. They need to be allowed to defend themselves and take up iron. This is a logical religion. This makes sense. This is the religion of humanity. And Allah is very clear. He says, had we not permitted this, then the transgressors would overcome the earth. Tyrants would overcome the earth and subjugate its people if good men do not stand up against them. Standing up against tyranny is not terrorism. Being passive in the face of tyranny is terrorism. In our philosophy, without getting on a, into a philosophical debate, evil is not an independent existence. Evil does not exist on itself. Rather, evil, we refer to it as Adami. Yeah? It only exists where goodness does not exist. It fills that void. Meaning evil is the lack of good. Where good does not exist, this is what we call evil. So in our philosophy, when the good are quiet, when the righteous are quiet and passive, then they are in fact contributing to evil. By not promoting and enforcing that which is rightful and that which is good. And this is the proper implementation. And this is the proper understanding of that in iron there is great benefit to mankind. Because through taking up this iron, we are capable of standing in the face of those who have took it up for the sake of evil. Now back to our talk on government. We gave the verse. We've established that Allah Azza wa Jal sends his messengers with the books and the mizan so that mankind can rule one another justly. Do we have examples of a divine government in history? We have many. We go back to the Holy Quran, the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, 
Allah Azza wa Jal gave him a kingdom and Dawood alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal gave them kingdoms and they ruled by the rule of Allah. And in our narrations, we have several narrations that speak about the government of Imam al-Mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif that say he will rule with the ruling of Dawood alayhi salam. And we'll get back to this narration and so on. We go all the way to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The first order of business after the migration to Medina is what? Establishing the masjid in Medina. Building this masjid and making it the center of government in Medina. With the Holy Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as the head of state. And the Quran and the Wahi as the constitution of this state. See brothers and sisters, before we go on with the examples of divine government in history. Those who argue the third opinion that we gave. That Islam is a government for all times. In the presence of the ma'soom or not. They touch on a few points to bring this forth. They say as Muslims our constitution is the Holy Quran. The most sacred pillar of this religion is the Holy Quran. This is the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. It dictates our lives. They say if this divine book was revealed in Allah's wisdom because we know that Allah Azza wa Jal is wise. He doesn't do anything out of abath. He doesn't do anything just for the sake of doing it. They say that if we are saying Allah Azza wa Jal is wise and He has revealed this book to us and in this book there are laws regarding marriage, laws regarding divorce, laws regarding capital punishment, laws regarding economics, Laws regarding social and family affairs. How are we supposed to implement this Quran if we have no government? Did Allah re reveal these verses just for the time of the Ma'soom? Or is the Quran holistic? Or is the Quran for every era and every time? After the government of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, which in fact is a miniature model of the government of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Imam al-Mahdi salam Allah alayhi, when we speak about the government of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, it is a continuation and it is the spreading on a and establishing on a grander scale the government of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And it's for this reason Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, as I stated in the beginning, when he speaks about the government of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, he refers to it as what? Dawlatuna, our government. It is the government of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam who is the head of state after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, whether he sat on the throne of Khilafah or not. Because in our doctrine, as Shia, Imamiya, Ithna Ashariya, it is Allah Azza wa Jal who appoints his Khalifa. And just as the silent Quran, the book, is our constitution, Al-Quran and Natiq is our governor. The speaking Quran is our ruler. But when the Ummah after 25 years of failure came to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam demanding that he take the reign of government Salamullah alayhi reminded them about a few years prior after the second had passed away, 
And they came and they offered Ali ibn Abi Talib the Khilafah under one condition. They said to him, that you abide by the book of Allah, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the sunnah of your two predecessors. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam refused. He refused. He said, I will rule by the book of Allah and by the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and my understanding of the sunnah. He has no opinion of his own, Ali alayhi salam. He says, I will abide by no one else's sunnah except the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the law of the Holy Quran. When they came to him, just before the advent of his Khilafah, this was the condition he gave them. That I will rule by the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and by the sunnah of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi and my implementation of this sunnah. And they agreed. And for four or five years, Ali ibn Abi Talib in this ocean of discourse and war and civil unrest in the Ummah, picking up the fragmentations and the pieces of this destroyed nation, Ali alayhi salam is implementing to the best of his capability, to the best of anyone's ability, the kingdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. And history will today bear witness and forever bear witness that the most just government to ever shine light on this earth was the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The government where the head of state would spend his nights going door to door feeding the poor and the orphans and the widows. And they would not know that he is the head of state. That he is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Salamullah The government where Ali alayhi salam hears that one of his representatives, Malik al-Ashtar radwanullahi alayhi, attended the gathering of the rich in Egypt. Did nothing haram. Did nothing haram. Did not break the rules of Allah Azza wa Jal. Imagine one of our governments doing this today. Malik al-Ashtar is the ambassador of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he is the governor appointed by Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam over Egypt. He is invited by the prominent figures of Egypt or some of the prominent figures of Egypt to a meal or a gathering. And Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam hears of this. Look up the letter. Look up the letter tonight that Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Imam Ali alayhi salam's letter to Malik al Ashtar. Go and read this letter. And see divine justice. And see divine mercy. Where Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam is now admonishing Malik. <coughs> Telling him, in your region there are poor. There are those who cannot afford bread. And now the governor appointed by Ali alayhi salam is sitting at the table of the rich and eating, Ya Malik. Admonishes him for a simple act. In the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, where Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam splits mankind into two, two categories. When he sees an old poor man walking at night and his back is, uh, his back is uh, arced over and he looks like he's in distress and looking for food, Ali alayhi salam in the streets of Kufa sees this sight. And he asked his companions, who is this? Why is there such a man under my governance? Go and bring from Baytul Mal 
and give him. They said to him, Ya Ali, إِنَّهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الدَّمَّةِ Oh Ali, he is not a Muslim. He is from amongst the people of the book. Because this was the mentality that they had been raised on for 25 years. This was the Islam that they had been raised on and got used to for 25 years. Ali is shocked. He says, this man lives under our ruling. Then he says his famous saying, that people are of two types. They are either your brothers in religion, or you're equal in humanity. Wallah, a constitution for mankind everywhere. This should be written. A constitution for mankind everywhere, in every era. I challenge a government of today to produce such a constitution in one or two lines. Salamullahi alayhi hears that the khawarij who claimed to be Muslim, that the Khawarij had attacked a village and removed the earrings from the ears of a Jewish woman. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, if someone were to die out of heartache from hearing this, he should die. Where Ali alayhi salam does not sleep. Lest there be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. <coughs> in Yemen or in Hijaz or in Iraq. Who sleeps without food. This is Ali alayhi salam. This is the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. This is the government that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam goes to Kufa to establish. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when asked about his mission statement, what are you going out to do? Where are you taking all these women and children? Why are you going off to Kufa? Are you going off to cause sedition and trouble in the Ummah? And I'm paraphrasing here. He said to him, no, I have gone, or I am going but to restore the nation of my grandfather and to reform the nation of my grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What's this restoration? What's this reformation, ya Hussein? Why does it need reform? What does Al-Hussein alayhi salam say? Look what his concern is. He says, do you not see that the halal of Allah has been made haram and the haram of Allah has been made halal? And people do not enjoy good, nor do they forbid evil. It is for this, the establishment of this government, that respects the laws of Allah Azza wa Jal, and enjoins good and forbids evil, that Al Hussein alayhi salam goes to establish in Kufa. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam does not leave the city of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Put himself and his family in danger Just to go sit in Kufa Just to go be Imam Jama'ah in Kufa He is not killed Because he wanted to go And lead Jama'ah prayers in Kufa Imam al Hussein alayhi salam Is going to Kufa to establish The government of Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa our Imams alayhum as salam, all of them, from Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam to Imam al Mahdi salamullahi alayhi. Every single one of these Imams is either slaughtered or poisoned. Why? Did the tyrants fear their prayers and their dua? Did they fear the laws and the ahkam of Tahara? If they did not suspect or genuinely feel, these tyrants, that these Imams threaten the very establishment of their kingdoms, they would have left them alone. 
But this was not the case. Every one of our Imams was slaughtered and poisoned. And many of them, before they were slaughtered or poisoned, imprisoned, either under house arrest or moved to another country or placed in an actual prison because they were feared. Their governments were feared. They were feared by the tyrants of the time. And all we need to do is look at the mission statement of Imam al-Mahdi and we'll end with this. As I said to you the other night, when we read the ziyarat and ad'iyah related to Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam, let's read them like mission statements. Read them as documents highlighting the objectives of the coming of the Imam alayhi salam. And one of the most popular ad'iyah related to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam taught to us by Imam al-Sadiq salam Allah alayhi is dua al-Ahd. Dua al-Ahad, which is recommended for us to recite every morning after Salat al-Subh. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam teaches it to his companions. And we have received it through this chain of narrations. Towards the end of the dua, some of the statements, the mission statements of the Imam is given. We are given a glimpse of what Imam al-Mahdi's government will look like. This is what is to come. This is the glad tidings that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us. We read, فَظْهِرِ اللَّهُمَّ لَنَا وَلِيَّكَ وَابْنَ بِنْتِ نَبِيِّكَ الْمُسَمَّى بِاسْمِ رَسُولِكَ So make emerge for us, O Allah, your wali, your friend, and the son of the daughter of your messenger, who was named after your messenger. حتى لا يظفر بشيء من الباطل إلا مزقه. Make him emerge, O Allah, so that he does not come across anything of falsehood except that he shreds it, Ya Allah. So this is the first objective of the government of Imam Al Mahdi alayhi salam: to eradicate falsehood, to eradicate batil. وَيُحِقَّ الْحَقَّ وَيُحَقِّقَهُ And to restore truth after abolishing falsehood, make him, Ya Allah, aid him, Ya Allah, in restoring truth, making the truth clear and restoring it. وَجْعَلْهُ اللَّهُمَّ مَفْزَعًا لِمَظْلُومِ عِبَادِكَ And make him, O oh Allah, a refuge for those who are oppressed amongst your worshippers and servants. Yani Imam al Zaman alayhi salam, he will come, destroy falsehood, establish truth, and he will be aided with Allah Azza wa Jal to the point he has the might and the strength and the power and the capacity to defend the oppressed. وَنَاصِرًا لِمَنْ لَا يَجِدُ لَهُ نَاصِرًا غَيْرَكَ And a supporter for those who have no supporter but Allah Azza wa Jal. So Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, if he is the supporter of those who have no supporter but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam is the support of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمُجَدِّدًا This is the important one. وَمُجَدِّدًا لِمَا عُطِّلَ مِنْ أَحْكَامِ كِتَابِكَ And allow him, Ya Allah, to revive. Allow him, Ya Allah, to restore what was shelved and put aside from the laws of your book. See here, Imam al-Sadiq is making a clear statement to us. Making a obs first observation is that the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, the book as a book, has not been touched. We as Muslims all agree, despite 
maybe some minor claims here and there from both sides that the Quran has been tampered with. But overall, unanimously, us Muslims believe in one Quran. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is not speaking about the Quran being tampered with and changed. No. But he says the ahkam, the laws, the rulings in this book are no longer applied, ya Allah. They have been abandoned. This final savior of ours, Imam al Sadiq is teaching us in this dua. One of his main objectives is to restore the ahkam, the rulings in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal that have been made idle or negated or dropped or ignored by the Muslims. Not just the book of Allah, the Imam continues. وَمُشَيِّدًا لِمَا ورد مِنْ أَعْلَامِ دِينِكَ وَسُنَنِ نَبِيِّكَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ And he will strengthen, he will strengthen what has come in your religion and reinstate the sunnah of your Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله. When we read and we read it a lot and we hear it a lot that Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam will come with a new religion. Correct? We hear this all the time. That he will come with a foreign religion, a religion which is strange. People will look at this religion and not recognize it. Is it that the religion of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam is different to the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Is it different to the religion of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam? Inna ad-dina anda Allah al-Islam. Religion with Allah is Islam. The religion of Allah is Islam. There is no other religion. What's this new religion, ya sahib al-zaman? No. But we have deviated so far from the path and eradicated so much of the Holy Quran's ahkams and rulings and abandoned so much of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That when the Imam Salamullah alayhi, when he comes with the proper and pure Islam of his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and his grandfather Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the original untampered Islam, Al Islam al Muhammadi al Asil, to you and I and to the rest of the world, it looks foreign. It looks foreign. And this brings us back to the narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam who says, Bada al-Islam gharibah. Islam began as a stranger. وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا And it will return to becoming a stranger. طُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاء Glad tidings to the strangers. Meaning glad tidings to those who hold on to this religion which will reach a point where everything about this religion seems strange in your societies and you are deemed backwards and you are deemed to be a, an extremist if you adhere to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa to grow your beard is frowned upon sister in proper hijab is frowned upon if she chooses to wear the abaya of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam, the abaya of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, this community will make her life hell. This community will make her life hell. But if she were to wear a simple hijab with tights and a tight t-shirt, nobody would question her. Nobody would question her. But when the proper deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is being implemented, she's an extremist. She's a weirdo. Look at how she looks. When a brother refuses to eat but haram, but halal, his friends make fun of him. It's all the same, bro. This is beef and this is beef. It's all the same. Why are you so extreme? Because he wants to 
eat halal. Wallah! I, this is a true story. Somebody asked me once if I prayed. I said, yes. This is a Muslim, a Shi'i. You pray? You don't drink alcohol? Exact words? You're an extremist. Praying and not drinking alcohol makes you an extremist. Not listening to music, extremist. I don't attend mixed weddings. Why are you being so extreme? Oh, don't, don't talk to him. He doesn't go to weddings. He doesn't listen to music. He's so extreme. We've become strangers. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi described it beautifully, perfectly. In dua al-iftitah, towards the end of the dua, because we are ending now the discussion on the concept of government in Islam. We have established that in Islam, we do have a form of government. Islam is a religion of government. Whether we agree that it is implemented only in the time of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam or implemented before that, we agree that it exists and that it will be implemented at the time of the Imam alayhi salam. We have in Dua al-Iftitah towards the end, Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema tu'izzu biha al-islam wa ahla wa tudhillu biha al-nifaq wa ahla wa taj'aluna fiha min al-duaati ila ta'atik wa al-qadati ila sabilik wa taruzuqana biha karamata al-dunya wa al-akhira. This last part here, this dua is discussing the we are asking Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us this generous or this dignified nation, Ad-Dawla al karima What is the objective of it? To izzu biha al-Islam wa ahla. Through this government, Ya Allah, bring honor and dignity to Islam and the Muslims. Wa tudhillu biha al wa ahla. And bring disgrace to who? Bring disgrace to hypocrisy and the hypocrites. And make us through this government, Ya Allah, amongst the callers towards your worship. And allow us to lead the people towards you through it. And grant us, this is the important part here of Imam Mahdi's government. Karamata dunya wal akhira. The government of Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam guarantees your dunya and your akhira. Because Islam is not a religion based simply on akhira. As Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam he says, he says he is not from us who gives up his dunya for his akhira. Nor is he from us who gives up his akhirah for his dunya. Yeah, Islam requires this balance. We don't have hermits in Islam. People are not encouraged to go out and sit in mountains and just pray and disassociate from people. No, Islam is about your dunya and your akhirah. Through your dunya, gain your akhirah. And through the government of Imam al Mahdi, alayhi salam, we guarantee our dunya and our akhirah, inshaAllah. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن عدوهم اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج والعافية والنصر واجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره وشيعته ومحبيه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم اكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة بحضوره وعجل لنا ظهوره إنهم يرونه بعيدا ونراه قريبا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل يا رب على محمد وآله الطاهرين وعجل فرجهم والعن عدوهم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول
رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا باب نجاة الأمة طبطهم وطابت الأرض التي فيها دفنتم ما خاب من تمسك بكم سادتي وأمنا مثواكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أنا زينا أنا زينا وإذا عندك تمع بالعين تعالوا يا خل نبكي سوى على حسين أنا بعيني نظرت الجسم الموذى وبإذني سمعت ضلوعة تتكسر يا يا وانا القبلت اخوي حسين بالمنحار تمنيت تمنيت احط خدي على خده لكن شفت اخوي راس ما عندي قالت خويا خويا أخبرك راح الحجاب وقعدنا يا يا بخرابة على التراب وطبنا يا لعد ديوان الأجناب خويا خويا بعد هالعز بعد هالدلاء والله خويا ما جانت على البال أطب المجلس وبزنود الحبال أطب المجلس وبزنود الحبال It's me Zainab And if you hold tears in your eyes Come with me and for Hussain Let us let out these cries With these eyes I watched his body in its final state With these ears I heard his bones crush and break and with these limbs I kissed his neck with no head I wished I could place my cheek on his on his at his deathbed she turns to Hussein's grave and complains about the immoral treatment and sham's pain Hussein they whipped us and took our face cover Threw us on the floors of dungeon ruins, dear brother And after a life of being surrounded by saints They forced me to enter courts enslaved with restraints The pearls of Zainab had their turn giving lessons for the brave to learn from the battlegrounds they did not run together they fought as if they were one Zainab sacrificed her all even her sons she carried tragedies outweighing tons 
Oh, for her beloved brother Hussein, if she could, she would do it over and over again. Tonight is the night of Aoun and Muhammad. But let us venture where we can also say it's a night for the mothers, mothers of Karbala, mothers of trials and tribulations, mothers of our defenders putting their life on the line for the sake of Islam and Muslims. Let us comfort these mothers tonight, these great women who put priorities of religion before worldly desires, one of them being the apple of their eye. Let us comfort Ramla, the mother of Qasim, Layla, the mother of Ali al-Akbar, Al-Rabab, the mother of Al-Asghar, the infant, Ummul Banin, who lost four sons, Zainab, the mother of Aun and Muhammad, and the mother of Masaib, trials and hardships. And let us comfort Sayyidati wa Mawlati Fatima, ما سلام الله علي مضرب رب أبا عبد الله بالمدينة فاطمة نصبت عزية ويا لغا من مصيبة يا أم الرزية اتقل حسين نحرق جدك القبلة مقطوع واختك زينب سبية مقطوع واختك زينب سبية يا يا in Medina, Fatima cries for Hussein, her son. What have they committed? What have these evil men done? The neck your grandfather kissed is now on a spear. Your sister Zainab is prisoner, dragged from there to here. Zainab, the one who collected herself and was patient through her life. First she lost her beloved grandfather, Rasulullah. Then her mother, Fatima, salamullahi alayya, was crushed behind that door. Her unborn brother, Muhsin, killed. Then her beloved father, Ali, struck in salat. And Zainab became a copy of Ali, salamullahi alayya in speech and patience and she inherited the trials of her mother then she saw her brother al Hassan salamullah who was poisoned and she watched him spill his insides now she watches from the Zainabi hill Zainabi as Karbala's horrors unfold before Imam Hussein, salamullahi alayhi, began his journey, Abdullah ibn Ja'far, who could not join the battle as he was ill, brought his two sons and handed them to the Imam, saying, O oh, Imam, since you have decided to go and will not allow me to come with you, please take my sons with you. Aun will represent his maternal grandfather, Imam Ali, and Muhammad will represent Present his paternal grandfather Ja'far al Tayyar, both great warriors. So, what do we expect from these, these children to be? He then went to Zainab, saying, I have brought you our two sons to go with you in this time of difficulty. On our Mawla Aba Abdullah, give one son as a sadaqa charity from your side, and the other as a sadaqa from mine. These two children were quite young. Our was about 13 and Muhammad was said to be one or two years younger. They had learned the art of fencing and sword fighting from their uncle Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and took great pride in it. The ninth night of Muharram was the night of Ashura. No one in Hussein's camp slept. Men spent the night in prayer, reciting Quran and Dua. What were the mothers doing? They were preparing their children.
Were they preparing them to be careful to hide or save their lives? No, they told their children to sacrifice their lives in aid of their master Hussein. They loved their children like any loving mother, but they saw the bigger picture. They saw their imam alone. They saw the reform of religion through this sacrifice. Listen to what the mothers of Karbala told their children. Layla tells Ali al Akbar, My son, remember your life is not more important than the life of your father. Your father's life will be in danger. Do not hesitate to give your life to protect your father's life. Ramla tells Qasim, Qasim, my darling son, if your father was alive today, he would have sacrificed his life first. My darling, do not embarrass me in front of your father on the day of judgment. Do not hesitate to sacrifice your life for your uncle's life. Um Kulthum, Imam Hussein's sister is sitting crying. Abbas heard her and came to her tent and asked, My sister, why are you crying? What is the matter? She said, Abbas, tomorrow is the day of sacrifice, but I have no children to sacrifice. Abbas replied, My darling sister, do not cry. Abbas is still alive. Tomorrow I will sacrifice my life as a gift on your behalf I will be your sacrifice now Zainab Sa'adallah qalbuki ya Zainab Zainab looks at her sons and says my sons Aoun and Muhammad tomorrow is the day of the battle your uncle Hussein's life will be in danger if anything happens to him while you are still alive I will be filled with shame my darlings Aoun and Muhammad I will not be able to face your grandmother Fatima on the day of judgment Please, my dear sons, do not let me down. كيف أقف في وجه البتول وحسين على الثرى مذبوح ماذا أفعل ماذا أقول وفؤاد أمي فاطمة مجروح It's the day of عاشوراء علي أكبر gave a thang for fajr Imam Hussein led the salat When the battle begins all of Imam Hussein's companions are martyred Zainab is watching Yam Walid as the bodies are carried to the tents one after the other she called her sons Aoun and Muhammad My sons what are you waiting for? Why have you not been to the battlefield yet? Go and fight the enemies of Islam They replied in a sad tone Mother since dawn we have been to Uncle Hussein many times for permission to fight He keeps refusing us Mother you help us ask Uncle Hussein to give us permission Zainab calls Hussein to the tent Brother Hussein, I have been like a mother to you, haven't I? Your mother is begging you to let her sons go to the battlefield. Do you remember in the battle of Safin? Abbas was only eight years old. When he saw someone try to attack you, he rushed to the battlefield and killed that man. Do you remember how proud our father Ali was of Abbas? Today I want to be proud of my son. I want to see them go out and defend, defend Islam. Will you not allow me that privilege? The Imam replied, Zainab, dearest, jihad is not compulsory on children. How can I let my sister's sons be killed while I am still alive? No, Zainab. Hussein, she says, my brother, if Ali Akbar is murdered before my sons, how will I be able to face our mother on the day of judgment I will be filled with shame let them go please Hussein saw the disappointment on Zainab's face her eyes filled with tears Hussein then put his arms around Aoun and Muhammad he kissed them and led them to the battlefield they turned and called out to their mother Fi amanillah ya 
Ummah. Zainab replies, Fi Amanillah, my scions. They attacked in the battle, they entered the battlefield and on called out, In Tankuruni, Fa'an ibn Ja'far, Shaheedu Sidqin, Fil Jinani Azhar, Yatiru Fi Ghab, Janahin Akhdar, Kafa Biada Sharafan, Fil Mahshar. If you deny me, for I am the son of Ja'far al-Tayyar The martyr of truth and heavens afar Flutters in it with wings so verdant Unrobal enough for us on the day of judgment Then Muhammad approaches saying Ashku ila Allahi min al-Udwan Qad baddalu ma'alim al-Quran Fi'alu qawmin fi'l-rawa umiyan Wa muhkamu تنزيل والتبيان وأظهر الكفر مع الطغيان To my Lord I send my complaint and concerns On an enemy who changed Quran's teachings they never learned The wrongdoings of a tribe that's blinded By shaitan's power and chains they were binded They fought bravely together They pushed enemies back every time they killed someone they would look at Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, their teacher, and seek his approval, see if he is pleased with them. So they fought so well that at one point Ibn Sa'd asked, Who are these two youngsters? They fight like I see Ali ibn Abi Talib. He told the soldiers to give up single combat and separate the two by attacking them from all sides. Soon Aun and Muhammad were overpowered. Enemies surrounded them. Attacked by horsemen running from one side to another struck with spears and swords daggers arrows they called out assalamu alayka ya aba abdullah adrikna adrikna uncle come quick uncle help us peace be upon you Hussein and abbas rushed to the battlefield the children were severely wounded Taking their last breaths Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Uncle send our salams to our mother And their pure souls departed Wa awna wa muhammad Imam Hussain and Aba al-Fadl abbas Carried their bodies to the tent. Ali Akbar cried out, Akhi Aun, Akhi Muhammad, Qad Qutilu. My brother Aun and Muhammad, my brothers Aun and Muhammad have been killed. Zainab heard the cry from her tent. She did not shed a tear. Imam Hussein walked to her tent to console her. He found her in sujood praying, saying, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al qurban. Oh Allah, I thank you for accepting my sacrifice. My heart is filled with pride because my two sons were, have given their life for our religion. Why didn't Zainab want her brother to feel? Why didn't Zainab cry? She didn't want Abba Abdullah to feel guilt in any way. But after the battle was over, it is narrated that Sayyidah Zainab on the 11th night of Muharram, when they had burned the tents, they had killed the men. And they, had, and they had trampled the children. They say that Sayyidah Zainab was running through the martyrs that lay on Karbala's sands, trying to reach her brother Hussein's crushed bearded body. She trips over and realizes she tripped on her own son's body. 
She begins to speak to her brother Bilisan al Ma ban al Jithat Yahsan, Ulid Yahsarit Yama, Ugilt al Rai Hal Khalak, Zal ibn Makim Dama, Khalet Ujid Alek, Khoya Udam Atit Lali, Mtet al Zagr Wigfai, Ugilt al Lamash al Ghali. ما غمن الولد مطروح دليل الشوفتك هايم قوموا نشف عيوني وخل بتربته نايم عون واخوته يرحون فدوى النظرة عيونك جاوبني يا ابو السجاد شنه الغير اللونك كنك تستمع صوتي أريدك تنهض هسا ابن الشاغد الجثة يمك ما أذرك أذكر أنسى ما يغون الظنال ما بس الأكثر الخوة هيك الدغر خلاني وعقبك سوى ما سوى I stumbled through the valley of death towards you as I run. I see a tiny blood soaked body and realize it's my own son. Telling him stay here while I go to your uncle's remains. Left him behind to check on you, my darling Hussein. I cared not for my flesh and blood, all I want to see is you. May we all be sacrificed for just your glimpse that is overdue. Answer me, brother, please don't make me be while I cry I don't want to let the enemies gloat by seeing tears leave my eye my children's bodies laying on these plains are of no comparison of no comparison to witnessing the loss of your brotherhood Hussein life has been cunning towards me and my heart the prophecy fulfilled and now me and my soul are apart that is on the battlefield but what about when Zainab returned to Medina she enters her home no brother Hussein no children no Ali Akbar, no Qasim, no Abbas, her protector Abbas. Wakani biha taqul bilisan al hal. Yabnum mib sawad al lil. Mina gaid ibn wast al dar. تمر أيامنا الحلوة وذكر يوم كنا صغار بين أمنا البتول وبين أبونا حيدر الكرار من واحد لعد واحد مسرورين خويا اليوم إيش ما أنسى تذكرني دار خويا صبانا انا وياك يا الغالي وخونا المجتبى ويانا خويا على وسادنا من الليل انا وياك فرحانا ومن يصبح صبح باكر ونقضي بالسرور اليوم شبينا سوى يا حسين على المرة وعلى الحلوة مثل خوتنا ما صارت على طول الدغار خوة 
جنت عن كل غلي الماضين وعن انوارهم سلوى اشاهد فيك وجه امي وجد والد الجد خويا كان تريدني انسى وبطل نوحي ونيني خذ ذكراك من قلبي وخذ صورتك من عيني ايام الجنت وياك انا غيك وتناغيني شلون تريد ينسى وبطل النوح لو ارتاح Brother Hussein in the darkness of the night I sit alone in our empty home I recall our younger days all together in the light And remember when we were young and used to roam Me and you with our brother Al-Hassan Al-Mujtaba All together by holy parents we were raised in the arms of Fatima al-Lab of Ali al-Murtada We spent our greatest loving days On the same pillow we slept in content and glee And I would wake to your holy face But now brother Hussein if you could see I cry alone in this dark space we grew together through smiles and pain We saw the good and bad times No, slip, no siblings were like us, Brother Hussein No kinship was like mine I saw our mother, father and grandfather in your face When our family's glow faded away you were the warmth I would embrace But that warmth is gone in these days Brother, how do you expect me to forget you And stop my tears and my cries Then the only thing you could do Remove your memory from my heart An image from my eyes إن لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين يا كاشف السوء اكشف السوء عنا يا الله اللهم شاف مرضانا وفك أسرانا وانصر مجاهدينا وعلمائنا ولأرواح أمواتنا لا سيام المرحوم خضر ناصر حج يوسف شاهين حج حسين جمعة حج محمود جمعة حج علي شاهين حج زينب فارس علي شاهين محمد شاهين عباس جمعة الحاج نعيم شاهين الحاج خليل الشيخ علي محمد حسين ناصر حج فاطمة علي خميس حج زينب تحفة علي ديب طالب فاطمة عيسى العمار محمود العمار محمد أبو غسان العمار لأرواح أمواتنا وأمواتكم رحم الله من قرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات